I'm Alex Toby, this is XDA TV, and this is an iPhone 14 Pro, or more accurately, my iPhone 14 Pro. It's actually the first time I've used an iPhone as a daily driver in more than a decade. Way back in 2010, I was carrying an iPhone 3G, which was the first Apple product I'd owned that wasn't an iPod. And while I've played with some iPhones on and off over the years, this is my first time in a long, long time fully moving into one and using it as my main device. So these are my impressions of someone who's lived and breathed Android for pretty much as long as Android has been popular, exploring a very different iOS world to the one that I left 12 years ago. There's a lot to unpack here, so take a sec to subscribe and we'll get started. I'm normally someone who prefers bigger Android phones, so you might wonder why I'm using the iPhone 14 Pro here as opposed to the Pro Max. And there are a couple of reasons really. Firstly, the Max is seriously backordered here in the UK, but also for this kind of phone with this very chunky flat design, the 6.1 inch diagonal just feels like a better fit. There's still a lot about iOS that lends itself to this mid-sized body as opposed to a larger chassis. A lot of controls still live at the top of the screen and there are some gestures that require reaching across the entire width of the display. So to me, this just seems like the correct size for this design and this software experience. I picked up my 14 Pro here in the deep purple colorway because if I'm gonna buy my first iPhone in a decade, it's gonna be in the cool kids color that everyone's talking about. And it looks pretty nice. The purple is quite understated most of the time. And like most things Apple designs, you appreciate the attention to small details, like the way the camera hump is actually carved out of the glass itself, as opposed to being a separate piece. After using the Nothing Phone 1, which is basically iPhone Pro Max shaped, I was a little worried about how slippery this thing would be, but with the glossy sidewalls and extremely flat back, it's been perfectly fine. Just as well, since I'm going caseless with this phone, at least for now, we'll see if I live to regret that decision. But yeah, with a phone that looks as good as this, I really don't want to cover it up. I enjoy the contrast between the glossy sidewalls and the matte rear, as well as the symmetry in the screen board, as it's something you still don't see very much on the Android side. And the screen itself, of course, lives up to all the hype and the benchmarks. It's a gorgeous looking panel with vibrant colors that can ramp up super bright in direct sunlight. One small addition I've appreciated in this generation of iPhone is the new rear-facing ambient light sensor, meaning auto brightness takes into account light on both sides of the device. So for example, if you're sitting facing out of a window with not much light behind you, but a whole lot in front, the iPhone will know this and be able to ramp up its brightness accordingly. Let's talk about the actual switch. Getting started with this iPhone was pretty smooth in terms of the actual setup process, which can take an Android phone, track down most of its installed apps on the App Store, and then port over messages and accounts. But at the same time, it's a little problematic in terms of bringing data across from certain services. Let me explain. The one platform lock-in everyone talks about in the US is iMessage. And that's a whole other rabbit hole that we're not gonna go near in this video, but other regions with other favorite messaging apps have their own dilemmas to deal with, even if the app in question is available on both Android and iOS. The big one in Europe is WhatsApp, and until shockingly quite recently, switching platforms meant completely jettisoning your WhatsApp message and media history leading to a sort of cottage industry of apps of varying levels of sketchiness that claim to be able to transfer your stuff over unofficially. But this year, finally, transferring over WhatsApp data officially became a reality using the official switch to iOS app if you're going from Android to iPhone, and you can do it in the other direction too. But there's a catch. You need to do this while you're setting up your iPhone. If, like me, on my first time setting up this iPhone, you missed that window of opportunity, there's no way back. You'll need to factory reset and set everything up again. And you can only restore chat history and media, not calls, probably because of how iOS integrates calls from other services directly into its phone app. As much of a hassle as this was, the process did at least work for me. I've got something like 135,000 WhatsApp messages and around five gigs of media on my account, and they transferred over to the iPhone in around 30 minutes, not too bad. But if you rely on other messaging services, you might not be as lucky. Line, a popular app in Japan and Taiwan, is a particularly bad offender. Moving from Android to iPhone loses your but your most recent 14 days of Line messages. And as with WhatsApp, there are dodgy looking third parties that claim to be able to transfer your stuff over unofficially, but you'll have to pay up, deal with a recurring subscription that you'll probably forget to cancel, and use a modified APK file on your Android phone. And to top it off, reviews often complain of incomplete or failed transfers, because of course. It's not as overt a form of platform lock-in as iMessage is, but it's still pretty annoying, definitely something to make you think twice about switching platforms. Of all the messaging apps that limit you to one device at a time, I actually found that WeChat gave me the least hassle when moving platforms, surprising considering how much of a dumpster fire that app usually is. But anyway, kind of interesting how some of the biggest upfront pain points and barriers to switching for me personally didn't directly have anything to do with either Apple or Google. 
The iPhone 14 Pro I'm using is the international model with the much coveted physical SIM slot. Still, because of all the fuss around the eSIM only US version, I decided to port my number over to an eSIM to use in this iPhone. A couple of reasons for this. First, I want to keep the physical SIM slot free for using a second SIM when I travel with this phone. And second, well, just to see what it was like after hearing a fair few horror stories from folks in the US. So I switched a line to eSIM on Vodafone UK and the whole process was straightforward enough, handle 100% online and finished within around five minutes. Basically, you sign into your account online, tell them whether you're using an Android or iOS device and they email you a QR code to scan. That said, I don't doubt that there will be some eSIM teething issues for some people and I also don't doubt that Apple is eventually gonna at least try and make the iPhone eSIM only in most, if not every country, even if this isn't the most consumer friendly choice. We've been here plenty of times before. If you switch from one iPhone to another, one Google phone or one Samsung phone to another, you can pretty much keep all your stuff as it is on the newer device. But changing platforms is a different beast, inevitably meaning a lot of legwork to get up to speed if you're changing to iOS after years on Android. First things first, with a new phone, you've got to log into all your apps and accounts. On Android phones, autofill with Google usually handles things smoothly when I switch to a new device. On iOS, you've got Apple's keychain feature, but none of my stuff was there yet. Thankfully, Chrome on iOS can still act as a password manager, which gave me access to all my saved passwords from Android, but you need to remember to go in and set this up. For me, what happened next was a sort of realization that of course iOS is a more tightly controlled platform. It's not as much of a free-for-all as Android is, and you trade personalization for polish. Everything the iPhone does feels effortless and smooth, but that doesn't help you with any of the things that it just can't do. Nothing gets onto the iPhone without Apple's approval, and where there are rare examples of alternatives to things like the default keyboard or browser, these often feel like second-class citizens on iOS. Nevertheless, there is a lot more that iOS can do in 2022 compared to the early days of my iPhone 3G, which couldn't even change its home screen background. I was surprised to find that I really like the iOS implementation of widgets. That's something that's been around on Android forever, but until quite recently, never really have much of a consistent design language, though admittedly Google has taken strides towards addressing this with Material U in Android 12. But I guess the difference is you'll rarely run into an ugly widget on iOS, whereas, let's be honest, you don't need to look too far to spot terrible, visually discordant Android widgets. The functionality is a bit more limited as a result, though only a few rounded rectangular sizes are supported, there's no widget scrolling, and I've even noticed a few instances of third-party widgets not updating correctly in the background. Similar story with iOS 16's newly redesigned lock screen. It's fine, the much-hyped depth effect is pretty neat. These widgets aren't doing anything particularly revolutionary, and as always you may need to wait for your favourite apps to be updated to use them. These are different from the widgets that live on your home screen. But the new lock screens are pleasant enough to look at, have plenty of customization options, and even among the stock iOS 16 widgets you get to choose from, there are plenty of useful options. Apple's approach to the always-on display is pretty different to anything you'll find on Android. It's quite literally a display that's always on. Basically just a very low brightness version of your regular lock screen. A lot of people don't like this, either they find it too distracting or they worry about the battery drain it might cause. I also wonder how it might contribute to OLED burn-in over several years of use, but you've got to imagine Apple has probably factored that in. For me personally though, I'm fine with it. I don't find it particularly more useful than any of Android's always-on displays, but at the same time I haven't found it to be massively distracting. While the iPhone's home screen might not be as boring as it was when I used it way back in 2009, I'm still kind of lukewarm on the way it handles icons. The stacking from the top of the display and the jittery chaotic jumble that ensues when you try and rearrange apps or move them in or out of a folder. The notification paradigm on iOS, though not as bad as I'd feared, is also just not as elegant as Android's in my opinion. In terms of information density, presentation and ease of access, Android's notifications are just better, hands down. I haven't found myself missing any critical notifications, but the idea that most notifications live behind this invisible swipeable area that's hidden most of the time is a rare example of poor UX. Other than that though, the software and muscle memory side of the Switch hasn't been as arduous as I might have expected. Obviously, gesture navigation works pretty much the same on Android as it does on iOS, and even the lack of a universal back gesture hasn't been too bad to wrap my head around. You're just swiping in a different place most of the time to go to that previous screen on iOS. And some of the preloaded Apple apps are really well done too. I particularly want to call out the weather app, which goes far beyond providing a simple forecast, with minute by minute updates for precipitation, optional notifications for unexpected downpours, important in this part of the world, and an easy way to view daily temperature variations in the widget. It's a fantastic little app. I guess we should also touch on the dynamic island up here, which some have praised for its innovation and others have criticized for actually being more distracting than the old iPhone notch. 
Both are kind of true, but as someone who used a Pixel 3 XL many years ago with its big old bathtub notch, weird display cutouts are something that really don't bother me all that much. What strikes me more is how anyone else could have done this dynamic island concept at any time in the past four years. Display cutouts like this have been with us since late 2018 after all, but only Apple thought to lean into it and make it a core part of how you use the phone. On the other hand, day to day, there are only really a handful of things you'll notice it doing. It'll expand out if you're on a call or playing media in the background. It'll bubble up if it wants to authenticate with Face ID or tell you about your battery level when you plug it in. And if you're doing multiple things like streaming music and running a timer, it can split off a little extra bubble here to show you two things at once. There's nothing here that inherently needs the Dynamic Island to exist. You could do most of this stuff with a notification or status bar icon or whatever, and many Android phones do just that but it is a thoughtful addition to this iPhone that I really appreciate. In terms of the apps and services I use, things have been pretty seamless. I'm a big user of Google services, and of course, every Google mobile app has a pretty great iPhone version. These mostly look and behave identically to their Android counterparts, with a couple of exceptions. YouTube Picture in Picture for premium subscribers isn't supported on iOS because Apple doesn't like Google gating off features like this behind a paywall. Videos still play in the background, they just hop off into the dynamic island. Kind of a shame because Picture in Picture works great on the iPhone in other video apps. Then there's Google Fit, and honestly this one's a bit of a mess. It looks the same as it does on Android, but bizarrely after setting it up, it stopped recording any activities whatsoever for several days. On the iPhone, Fit gets its telemetry from the Apple Health app, so probably this is a case of the two not talking to each other properly, but it's a widely reported issue with Google Fit on iOS with no clear fix. For me though, it cleared up in a couple of days, but for others, Fit just seems to permanently stop recording activities when you switch to an iPhone. The functionality of Google Fit on iOS is also kind of hobbled without the ability to start or track individual workouts. And it doesn't let you see automatically detected exercise such as runs like the Android app does. You just see this list of random data points that's pulled from Apple Health, which means you can't distinguish walking distance from running distance, for example. It's just not a very helpful way of displaying this data. I still want to keep using Google Fit because it's multi-platform and I am going to still be using Android phones. But yeah, this is probably the start of a process that ends with me just buying another wearable like a Fitbit and using that to keep everything in track across both Apple and Google. With third-party applications, it's often argued that iOS just has better apps, either because there's less hardware variety compared to Android, so it's easier, or developers just value iPhone customers more, so they put more time and effort in. Long ago, this was definitely a thing that you'd notice in some apps, but I find the difference to be much less these days. For me, the experience is pretty familiar in 99% of the apps I use day to day. I think in 2022, if you're still seeing a noticeably better iOS app versus the Android counterpart, that's probably the sign of a lazy developer. The iPhone has often prioritized battery life over fast charging, and that's still the case with the 14 Pro, with charging speeds maxing out just shy of 30 watts based on third-party testing. That means you're going from the danger zone to around a half charge in about 30 minutes, provided you've got the right charger. Obviously, a lot of Android phones boast way quicker charging speeds than this, but potentially at the cost of battery health over time. As for battery life itself, I've heard some people, like my friend Jaime Rivera from Pocket Now, having a less than great time on the 14 Pro, especially compared to the Pro Max. That's with the US version of the phone though, with a more battery hungry millimeter wave 5G. On the model I've been using, my battery life has been pretty good, not exceptional and certainly not the level people were reporting seeing from the iPhone 13 Pro Max last year, but there's no question of it lasting me a full day, even with relatively heavy use. And something about the way it consumes power over time seems a little bit more consistent compared to most Android phones I've used. The Galaxy S22 Ultra or OnePlus 10 Pro, for example, can really chew through battery power on 5G or with heavy camera use. With the iPhone 14 Pro, the rate it goes down is a bit more steady and predictable. And there's also not that sudden plunge from 30% down to zero that I see from many Android phones. Perhaps that's more to do with how iOS measures the percentage that it shows you. Even so, I definitely have gotten better battery life out of some Android phones that I'm seeing from the 14 Pro here. That includes the Asus Zenfone 9 with its smaller display and large capacity battery. Most of the time though, I'll easily get through a full day and just plop it down on the wireless charger to trickle charge overnight. With the iPhone 14 Pro, there's still no power brick in the box, but if you want one that'll charge yours as quickly as possible, you want to check out today's sponsor, Spigen. Spigen has a bunch of charging accessories that work great with the iPhone 14 Pro, like their new ArcStation Pro dual USB-C chargers. These small but mighty chargers use GAN or gallium nitride components, so they're cooler and more efficient than other smartphone chargers, in addition to taking up less space in your bag. 
They come in three flavors, 35, 45, and 65 watts, and the two-port configuration means you can charge your iPhone and AirPods at the same time, or any combination of other devices that can plug into a USB-C port. They will of course work with the cable that comes in the box with your iPhone 14 Pro, but if you want a more substantial iPhone cable, you might want to check out Spigen's Aquai USB-C to Lightning connector. It's a two meter cable, meaning if you want a quick wired refill, you're not stuck to the wall while you wait. The Aqua cable has a premium braided finish with Spigen's DuraBand technology for long lasting durability, along with high quality aluminium port attachments, which feel more premium than the typical glossy plastic. Check the links in the description for more on these products and thanks to Spigen for sponsoring this video. A huge part of the iPhone's appeal is the Apple ecosystem. I don't own a ton of other Apple devices, I have a MacBook Pro and that's basically it. Even so, that's let me dip my toes in the waters of this ecosystem with features like handoff web pages and iMessage and CallSync across macOS and iOS. The simplicity of AirDrop too means I no longer need to use Slack or Google Drive when I'm swapping files between my laptop and my phone. It's all very simple and effortless. So I see the iPhone as kind of this gateway drug that pulls you into using more and more of the Apple ecosystem. A great and slightly insidious example of this is iCloud. To be able to use an iPhone properly, you basically need at least a 50 gigabyte iCloud subscription, which doesn't cost much. It's 79 pence per month here in the UK. And that 50 gigs is more than enough for device backup, WhatsApp backup and the like. But as you use your iPhone more and more and accumulate more photos, those automatically back up to iCloud too, unless you disable it. And that 50 gigs suddenly doesn't seem so big. I'm already paying for a substantial amount of Google Drive storage to sync photos and the like, so I'm keeping that stuff separate for now. I'm happy for my photos to live on the Google side and to save my limited iCloud storage for just the essentials. But someone else might be surprised at the need to add yet another monthly subscription to get the most out of an already expensive new smartphone. On the other side of that ecosystem argument, there are a few things that I miss about the tight integration with Google and Google Assistant that I get on Android phones. I use Google Cast all the time, so cast controls automatically popping up in the notification shade is something I find really useful that's absent on the iPhone side. On iOS, you'll need to go look in the Google Home app to find whatever's casting. And Google Assistant is just another app on the iPhone. It doesn't enjoy the privileged position that Siri occupies on Apple's devices. There are plenty of Google Assistant versus Siri videos out there already, but for me personally, I've found Assistant just to be consistently smarter. Yes, in part because Google knows more about me and I use more of their services, but also the vast amounts of data in Google's knowledge graph. It's hard for anyone, even Apple, to compete with that. The other big appeal of the iPhone, and especially the Pro iPhone, is the camera setup. And immediately one thing I miss going from a Galaxy S22 Ultra is the crazy long periscope telephoto camera. The iPhone's 3x lens is pretty reliable, even in darker conditions, but at 10x or above, even though the iPhone's output isn't horrible, it's a very clear win for Samsung every time. With that out of the way, yeah, this is one of the best phone camera systems out there. I can't speak to how much better it is than last year's iPhone, but the main sensor in particular really impressed me with its low light capabilities. And Apple's embracing of pixel binning, a technique we've had in the Android world for a few years now, means your zoom options are more versatile at between 1x and 3x. An interesting feature I found that perhaps seems a little un-Apple-like is the selection of looks in the camera app. These are different to filters, allowing you to choose between a regular image that's pretty close to what your eye sees, a more saturated option that's a bit closer to what you get out of a Samsung camera, or something more contrasty with the darker shadows for a slightly moodier look. All the features you'll know from flagship Android phones are basically here, a great night mode that activates automatically, a competent portrait mode with fantastic edge detection and studio lighting options similar to what I've used on Google's Pixel phones, Apple didn't do all of these things first, but they're executed here really well. Where I've noticed the iPhone camera really stands apart is in its video capabilities. This thing offers an otherworldly level of stabilization thanks to its new action mode. We've seen Android phones before with gimbal-like hardware to stabilize the image sensor, but Apple is doing all of this in post-processing, which makes it all the more impressive. So after my first week daily driving an iPhone in more than 12 years, I don't hate it, and I'm going to keep using it over the next few weeks alongside devices like the Pixel 7 and Fold 4. The iPhone is so polished at this point and generally excellent at most of what it does, but I guess what I've missed the most from the Android world are the more fringe features. Things like the S22 Ultra's 10x telephoto, or flex mode from the Flip 4, or super fast charging from the Honor Magic 4 Pro, or the OnePlus 10 Pro's weirdo fisheye ultra wide camera, or reverse wireless charging. The ultra mass market nature of the iPhone, as well as Apple's exacting standards, means it's not the kind of device that gets crazy experimental features. 
Everything that comes to the iPhone needs to be pixel perfect, so Apple is almost never first with new features like this. At the same time, life inside Apple's walled garden is pretty comfortable in a way that most Android phones, with the possible exception of the Pixel, really aren't. There's nothing about the way an iPhone works that's rough around the edges, like at all. And even switching from a rival platform 12 years after using my first and only other iPhone, it's easy for me to see how people pick up an iPhone and then just stick with it. And that's what I'm going to do for now, while of course continuing to use a whole bunch of other Android devices. If you've ever switched from Android to iOS or vice versa, let me know what pushed you to switch platforms down in the comments and how smoothly things went. And take a sec to subscribe so you don't miss all our coverage of Android, iOS and everything in between. But for now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.